Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the, having sat through several of the sessions today, as you all did as well, one could be excused for feeling a sense of descending doom and gloom, right? That you could walk away, there's a risk that one could walk away with that impression after the sessions we've heard about an economy going through the worst crisis since the Great Depression of the 1930s, a, uh, a uh, Ben Bernanke uh, speculating that the U.S. economy may no longer exist on Monday. Uh, one could walk away after some of these sessions uh, feeling rather gloomy. And the purpose of this session this afternoon is to help dispel some of that gloom, to help, or at minimum, put the gloom in perspective and counterbalance it with a discussion about the kind of opportunities, specifically opportunities to create economic value that arise in a downturn. So it's, it's very easy in the midst of this uh, global economic crisis with downward pressure on prices, downward pressure on demand, scarce credit, very easy to fixate on the downside. And yet that fixation on the downside, on the negative, obscures a crucial yet surprising truth, which is this, that the worst of times for the economy as a whole can be the best of times for individual firms to create economic value. Downturns uh, shift consumer preferences, create market opportunities. Uh, as demand for resources goes downward, goes, moves down, it creates a buyer's market for many resources from talent to technology. Uh, a downturn creates, a, again, a dearth of resources that forces difficult portfolio decisions within a firm that managers, frankly, probably shouldn't be making anyway, and opens a window of opportunity to drive through organizational change that might not have been open a year or two ago and may not be open a year or two from now. So the focus of this session is really to talk about the upside of the downturn and not let the, uh, the downside of the downturn, which is very real, of course, not let that obscure the opportunities that arise. And today, we're absolutely delighted to have three business leaders representing a diversity of industries, a diversity of geographic regions, to talk about how they, within their companies, within their groups, within their industries, are seizing the upside of the downturn. So I'll first introduce them briefly, and then they'll tell us each a little bit about uh, their company, and then we'll, uh, we'll start off with some questions. So immediately to my left, uh, delighted uh, to introduce Sunil, who runs, uh, I guess, your founder, chairman, and CEO uh, 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 of your group. Uh, and you'll tell us a bit about that, uh, Barty Enterprises, in a moment. Uh, next to him, we have uh, Jeremy Derrick, who uh, is Chief Executive and Director of uh, B Sky B, familiar to everyone in the UK. Uh, and at the other end, we've got Paul Pullman, who is the CEO of Unilever. Uh, so, Sunil, if you don't mind, maybe you could just give us a little sense of uh, the Barty Group. Yes. My name is Sunil Mittal, and uh, most of you in London would say, aha, we know the Mittal. But this is the other Mittal. <laughs> This is the telecom method, and then it's distinctive because of the middle name called Bharti. Sunil Bharti Mittal. Bharti Enterprises is a first generation company in India. I founded this company straight out of college in 1976 when I was 18. Uh, today, the company's main business activity is telecommunications. Uh, we run uh, India's leading telecom company, Airtel. And now we are entering into several new businesses in the area of providing services in the life insurance, general insurance business, some other financial services, and a joint venture with Walmart to provide India's first truly organized retail chain in the country. So it's, it's a group which now employs over 50,000 people, has a market cap in excess of $35 billion, and for the last four or five years, is ranked as the number two company by market cap in the country. And therefore, in some sense, I would say, I represent the changing face of India. Uh, Jeremy Darren from, uh, from Sky. We are the, uh, the UK's, UK and Ireland's uh, largest pay TV uh, television company in the, in the UK. Uh, but also, we have developed over the last few years an emerging uh, business in home communications built around broadband uh, and home telephony, which were also growing uh, very strongly. 
Our business interests, therefore, are, are pretty diverse. On the one hand, we are in the business of making TV programs and production uh, to uh, developing a telephony business and then having a large consumer-facing operation either through direct retail channels, through our own contact centers, and a countrywide installation and service uh, workforce uh, right across, as I say, right across the, the country. I represent Unilever for a small grocery company from Port Sunlight. <laughs> tries to stay small. We're about uh, 40 billion in turnover, at about 175,000 employees, about 100, uh, 100 countries that we do business in. Obviously, in fast moving consumer goods. We focus on some of our key brands. We have uh, 13 brands, 1 billion or more in, in turnover. Uh, I've been a CEO since January this year. The company has gone through a tremendous transformation in, in its portfolio itself and lately in its organizational structure. So this crisis could not have come at a better time to drive it to the next level. Uh, we're in fast moving consumer goods, so obviously very close to the consumer, very short purchase cycles. Um, so you can see uh, it's, a, it's a business that gives you immediate feedback, which is what I like. And obviously with the current environment out there, uh, we need to be very, very close to the consumer. I'll leave it like that for now. Then maybe we could begin by talking a little bit about how you see the economy. So, uh, and, and we'll start maybe with the UK perspective, uh, Jeremy. So, you know, we've heard a lot, of, a lot about the economy's kind of downward trend. And I guess the question is, has it paused? Is the downward trend slowing, stopped, reversing? How, how do you see it? Well, I think uh, there's no doubt that it's tough. I mean, you know, we, we find just trading in the, in the consumer, uh, sorry, in the UK uh, markets at the moment, uh, uh, difficult. I think it's, it's pretty hard to read. None of us, I think, feel like we've got a crystal ball. I'm sure that's some of the commentary that you've had earlier in the day. Uh, and I think there is a lot of speculation, is that, you know, are we, are we at the bottom, or in, in fact, are we going to see more of a perhaps W-shaped uh, recession um, over the next few years? My own view is that it's going to be you know, a long, a reasonably long haul out of uh, the environment that we're in. And I think one of the things that will dominate that is public finances in the UK uh, and you know, the emerging public deficit that we have and how that gets addressed, particularly because you know, we have so many people either directly or indirectly employed by, by the state in the UK today. Now that said, you know, in terms of our own business, we find over that, underneath that overall picture, significant opportunities. Certainly we see an environment where consumers are more choiceful about where they spend their money and what they spend their money on. But I think businesses that can provide great value to customers uh, and, and, and products that they really get a lot out of uh, are actually well placed. So our own business is not only growing at the bottom end where we offer great value in services like broadband and home phone, uh, but also we're growing at the top end. So our premium TV product, High Definition, which is really an emerging standard of TV in the UK, uh, is growing at, uh, at uh, you know, a very, very accelerated rate. So I think you know, the skill that, that, that we see is really under that blanket, finding out what are the kind of key opportunities that consumers will respond to, and really telling me your business to address those. Well, how, how do you see it? I mean, you have a global remit. No, I, I agree with Jeremy. It's not a question of uh, if we will have a recovery or not, because that will come. And, uh, you know, you hit the numbers at some, one point in time and you're going to bottom out. I'm not sure that we see all these green sprouts that people talk about. But the, the more important question is not if we will have a recovery, it will be what type of recovery. And uh, I, again, I agree with Jeremy that it's probably more of an L-shaped recovery than a U-shaped or a V-shaped recovery. Uh, without going into all the things you've talked today, uh, the, the leveraging that needs to happen in, in, uh, in the economies at large is tremendous. The U.S. Uh, national debt is now nearly 90, uh, 95% of GDP. The, uh, the banks, before they really get enough of the liquidity again to make that flow and, and deleverage them, consumer savings rates, which were absent in the U.S., have to be brought back to 3-4%. Uh, for us, the most important indicator is consumer confidence, to be honest. If you look at the current spending levels and the current uh, decrease in consumption that the uh, OECD refers to, or the IMF, which might be 3-4% down this year, uh, which, by the way, has, revised, has been revised downwards every month for the last five months. Um, 
is really driven more by consumer confidence than by anything else. 75% of, the, uh, of the, the drop in consumer spending is not actually explained by a drop in income or, or uh, reduced wealth, but it's, it's a reaction of the consumers towards a fear. So we are very close, uh, closely looking at consumer confidence. And until we see that moving up, um, you know, that, uh, that for us would be a sign that the economy is turning. Unemployment will undoubtedly go up a little bit more, and, uh, and perceived wealth will undoubtedly, for many, still go down a little bit more. Uh, again, in, in line with Jeremy, we don't think that that is a lack of opportunities. Uh, it's a reshifting in the economy that is taking place. But uh, as we will talk a little bit later, so I won't go into that now, uh, people that understand that and are close to these uh, consumers and trends have a better opportunity than ever, in my opinion. Sunil, so, how about uh, from your perspective? Well, I mean, India uh, has not lost its growth. Uh, what we have lost is the momentum. Uh, we are not growing at 9 or 10% anymore. We are down to 6.5% for the year. And in 31st of March, the prediction for the penalty year seems to be between anywhere between 6 to 7%. So for a trillion dollar economy to grow between 6 and 7% is still uh, very strong uh, uh, growth rates. But for India to wash off its uh, infrastructure problems, poverty, and putting uh, massive social programs at work, we really need to get back to 9 or 10%. And uh, what we have shaved off in terms of 2 or 3% really is the function of the global markets and global economies. And while India is not uh, coupled, it's not completely decoupled, and if the uh, US and the Western European markets are underperforming, inevitably it's going to have some pressure on India, and that's what we are seeing. And my hope is, as my colleagues just mentioned here, as the world recovers, I think India will get back to 9% and hopefully 10% growth. But India is putting uh, in a very heavy infrastructure debt program, $500 billion in the current five-year plan and a trillion dollars in the next five years. So in 10 years' time, we are looking at a public spending just in infrastructure of $1.5 trillion. And that's massive. And that's going to move the economy quite a bit. And thankfully, I think, given the public-private partnership programs, uh, we will see these programs finally get off the ground. Some of the work is visible other work will start getting visible. Remember India, the continent of 1.1 billion people, 630 million people in the world. Uh, by 2016, this number will swell to 830 million people. 55% of our country is less than 25 years of age. So it's a continent of consumers. And it's my belief that uh, we will see a sustained growth for the next several years. One of the uh uh, one of the sources of opportunities that emerges in a downturn is shifting consumer preferences. So a, a, a downturn changes how people think about their purchase patterns, how they gather information, and so forth. Paul, maybe we could start with you here. How, in, in FMCGs, how has consumer behavior changed? What kinds of opportunities has that created? And what specific things are you doing, uh, you believe you're doing, to, to pursue these opportunities? The first thing is in terms of the uh, opportunities, I was actually in preparation for this. I was looking at um, uh, previous uh, economic cycles and, and um, recessions or depressions, whatever you want to call them. And it, it is interesting, if you look at the Fortune 500 list, in fact, half the companies that are on there now were actually born during a depression. So then you wonder why that is the case, or is that just a, a fluke statistic? But if you think about it, it's the unemployment or the, the shift in risk factors that a lot of people can take because they don't have the job in the first place. You see tremendous opportunities that are actually being born. And you look at some of these inventions that we now take for granted. Uh, most of, of the inventions that we talk about, from the computer to the iPod, and many more, the transistor radio, whatever you have, all came out of periods of crisis like this. To come to, come to your question, what we um, we really see is that the consumer, I think the most important thing is that, that the consumer uh, has changed its value equation. And, and that's probably the most important shift. Uh, and again, uh, it's very dangerous to talk about averaging because I think a good company that wants to turn this into opportunity probably has to slice the consumers a little bit and have different type of consumers. The first trend that we see is, is definitely a little bit of an effect of uh, cocooning. Uh, people want to go back to something that is more comfortable. And 
the main thing that is more comfortable for people is probably their home environment. So we see more home cooking. We see more uh, prepared uh, prepared meals at home, obviously, and all these things. We see more home entertainment, and that's a shift driven by value. So that's a very big shift. We see major changes in consumer shopping habits. Channel shifts have been bigger now than they've ever been in the last 15, 20 years. Obviously, in the U.S., that would be a move to discount channels. In some other countries, it would be a, a higher frequency of shopping to the smaller stores close by. So there is a there is a major shift happening there. And then, obviously, we see a shift in in consumer spending itself, where perhaps some of the pernicious consumption uh, is being slowed down, and um, some of the basic necessities are are uh, preferred. Uh, interestingly. Uh, the main shopper for our categories is still the woman, uh, if we like it or not. 80% of the purchases in consumer goods probably is made by women. And what you see actually here when, when they're cash trapped, the first thing they actually do is, is save on themselves. Uh, everybody talks about this famous lager index of lipstick and during recessions women put on more lipstick. In fact, and what is happening currently is the opposite. They put on less to be sure that the family has a little bit more. But in all of this, um, the main message that I'm going to pass is stay close to a consumer. There is not one consumer. Every consumer will behave differently. If you're out of a job, you behave fairly differently than if you fear for your job or if your perceived wealth has come down but you still work. And then there are still enough people, don't be misunderstood, still enough people that don't have that high level of worry yet that there are some others. Jeremy, cocooning sounds pretty good, especially if they're watching uh, Sky. Is, is, uh, how, how do you see the shifts right. in the opportunities? Look, that, that, is, uh, that is exactly one of the things that we see. It was interesting. Going into the, to, um, to the current recession, many people questioned our core proposition of pay TV. Why would people keep paying for television uh, in a tougher environment when there was effectively a free alternative uh, a point of consumption to people? And quite the opposite has happened. And I think what we've seen is, first of all, this trend that, that Paul talked about, cocooning, people going back to the home, but also people being much, much more comfortable at uh, broadening their choice of entertainment. So today, people will be quite happy to say, you know, I'll make a trade-off between going out, taking the family out you know, to the cinema once a month, or having Sky TV for a whole, for a whole month. And that's something uh, that has benefited us uh, uh, considerably. I think the other trend that we're seeing in our business is the importance of technology to really enable people to get the best and the greatest value out of the service that you, they offer them. So for us, a product like uh, Sky Plus, which is our personal video recorder, that really allows people, once they've paid for TV, to say, here's a product we can give you, which really get, prepares you to get the best value from that service. I can guarantee that even if you're a light consumer of TV, that when you watch something, you watch the thing that you really want to watch, and that is resonating very strongly uh, with our with our customers. So two other things I'd just like to uh, pick up on one point that Paul made um, about consumer insight, which I think is critically important. You know, it seems to me consumer insight comes from understanding the individual or small groups of people, and the TV industry is very different to that. A lot of the TV industry is driven by mass audience share and mass viewing share, and we are. I think quite countercultural in terms of our view of the world. We are much more interested in penetrating what does it mean for an individual, an individual home. You know, what are what are the choices that that home is making? What is you know the mother in that home thinking about how she manages the household budget? Uh, and then really having a belief that if we can understand that at a deep level, you know, there are lots and lots of ways that that will replicate um, across uh, you know across the nation. Uh, and then finally, the, the, the final um, trend that we are seeing is this whole uh, concept of sorry, the whole issue of trust. And you know, consumers are really looking to brands and organizations that they can trust. And that's particularly true uh, in a subscription service when, you know, for our business, the vast value of our business is in the consumers that we have today, not the consumers that we'll acquire tomorrow. And so, you know, we've seen this, this um, Return really of trust as being critically important as a consumer brand, and therefore, how do you position yourself in a downturn? Is really how how can you uh, make sure that your uh, for us our existing customers can really rely on us to keep investing, uh, keep in, uh, keep delivering for their needs. So those are sort of three or four of the key trends that we're seeing. We're trying to position the business uh, against.
you know how about you? You drop from 10% to 6%. 6% sounds pretty good to most folks in this room, probably. Does it, does it shift how consumers are looking at uh, the, seeing the world? And well, most certainly. I mean, when, when things are not going as well, uh, the whole market environment uh, suffers, and therefore spending does uh, suffer. But India has traditionally been a high saving economy or a high saving society. And uh, the savings rates have only accelerated, which is good for the nation because a lot of wealth is being put to uh, good use in terms of building the nation. Uh, but there are many, many young people now who are borrowing and buying their first home or their first vehicle. And you're seeing the spending patterns now coming through. And uh, India is shifting from uh, one generation of savers to a generation of spenders now. So there's a good balance between the previous generation and the new generation that is coming through. But yes, there are uh, clear indications in the space of uh, vehicles where the buying has gone down. Real estate has suffered immensely in the last uh, 12 to 18 months, and we are seeing some sign of revivals. As a consequence of that, steel, cement, everything has suffered. Uh, but it's been a very short downturn in our case, and I must say, most of the Indians are used to managing uh, downturns rather well. I mean, we all know what downturn looks like lack of access to capital, poor markets or shrinking markets, uh, good resources leaving because the morale is down. India has more or less lived with this for a long period of time. The question is, what's the upside? And I would uh, hasten to add, the upside of the downturn uh, uh, is people like us. Uh, we came from the adversity in the economy in 1991-92 when India was almost on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, dozens of entrepreneurs took center stage and built businesses like never before. The question that uh, we have for some of us entrepreneurs is, how do you manage when things are very good? Because there's bound to be a massive downside after that. And companies like us who have become very, very successful need to now struggle uh, with the situation where if things are not as rosy or as good as they were for the last two decades, how you will manage uh, this massive upside? And that's what we're trying to learn. And, uh, Combining entrepreneurial skills with the toolkit that we have had for the last 30 odd years in our case, because we have built from scratch, to marry and combine them with professional managers to the best of the abilities is the biggest challenge that we have for us. So let's, let's maybe pick up on this theme. One of the aspects of a, of a downturn or an economic crisis, recession, whatever you want to call it, is it opens a window of opportunity when you can drive through change. And Ben Vervey in the previous panel talked about this, touched on this briefly. And for a variety of reasons, it you know creates an external rationale for hard decisions. You say that you don't say the devil made me do it, you say the downturn made me do it. You know, people look up to their leaders more. Uh, there's a sense of urgency that you can harness, it creates air cover with boards and so forth. So there are a variety of reasons that this opens this uh, window of opportunity to drive change through. Just as the window opens, the window shuts, right? It, it doesn't stay open forever. And, and so um, maybe, Jeremy, we'll start with you here. If you had to choose one change that you are trying to drive through B, Sky, B now, organizational change, not a market change, not a pursuit of a specific opportunity, but an organizational change you're trying to drive through in an organization that for years has been very adept at changing, you know, what would it be, why is it that one? Why is that one so critical? And, and what's your assessment? How is it going? I think, I mean, the, 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 the single thing is actually just that. You know, we are, we're 20 years old this year, so we're relatively young as a, as a, as a, as a business. We have a very low uh, average employee age, which is still in its 20s. So we're a very, we feel a very young company. Uh, and we grew up and were successful largely by going up against, you know, was then the established operators in our sector. For us now, we're, we're, we're now often, you know, the, you know, the, the, you know, the big guy on the street. And we've grown very successfully, and, um, you know, we are oftentimes much bigger than our direct competitors now. So, for me, the single biggest thing that I drive and focus on is how do we make sure that we never become an incumbent? That we retain the sense of challenge and that we are always opening open to moving on and changing our business and dispensing with what no longer, what no longer works and embracing the future. And I think for us, if we can keep true to that in terms of our culture, then we're going to be okay. Now, you have to accept with that that things are less predictable. You have to have an appetite for risk. You have to be willing to, to, to understand that you will do things that sometimes go wrong. And therefore, you also have to put alongside that 
you know, the controls and the environment that allows you to adapt uh, and, and innovate and move on you know, very, very quickly. So it is for us that, that staying true to really one of our core beliefs, which is perpetual improvement, the idea that you can constantly get things better, and if you can get the organization and the workforce motivated and stimulated by that, then you know, you'll con constantly find ways of uh, moving on. Less, we spend less time trying to, in our sector, define outcomes and say, you know, we'll place huge bets on this outcome. More we'll say, how do we you know, understand the trends that are going on and position the business perpetually for those trends uh, and constantly be able to move and adapt uh, and, uh, and change what we do, um, which, which, which eventually will put us in the right place. And I think one of the characteristics we see in our marketplace is that a lot of people who are you know, quite resistant to that and as a consequence tend to have a backward-looking view of the marketplace as opposed to a you know, forward-looking view of the marketplace. And certainly in media and technology, the one thing that you can say is that you know, the world is changing at a faster rate uh, than ever before. And how do you just to, sorry, just to push you to get a little more specific here, what would be some of the, how would you know to be nervous, like we're losing that edge, we're slipping into a complacent middle age? I mean, not to say that you are, but how would you know that was happening? And what are some of the things your team is trying to do to avoid that? I mean, kind of specific things that you're trying to drive. Well, you know, to give you a, a couple of examples, first of all, the, 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 the day that we stop uh, you know, taking decisions, first and foremost, through the optics of our customer, I think is a, is, a, is, a, is a big risk, you know? And sometimes that requires us to say, you know what, we're gonna make, we're gonna take tough decisions in the short term for, because we have a belief that we have to keep following our customers. So for example, you know, we pretty much don't offer a short term viewing discounts in our TV business. And the reason that we don't do that is not because that's not attractive for a new customer, it's because it's the one thing that's guaranteed to really frustrate and upset your existing customer. Yeah, it would be very easy for us not to do that. And in the short term, that puts a lot of pressure on our business. Um, but we're not going to do that because we know that long term that's going to undermine uh, the durability of our business. Yeah, there's a lot of debate in our sector at you know, the moment about top slicing of the BBC license fee. You know, how would you accept, in effect, you know, government funding to get yourself into new areas? Uh, and that's something which we won't do because we like the tension of, you know, our, of, of investing on our own ticket. Because we think that forces us to make the right choices. It forces us to make you know, the right decisions, not only in terms of the long-term interests of the business, but also to get really clear on how we're going to drive a return from those things. And I, you know, I would contrast that to a lot of our sector, you know, which in my view is too, you know, too willing to you know, try and compete you know, with the regulator or with government as opposed to focus on the marketplace. Okay. Paul, a large and storied institution with uh, many habits accumulated over here, many good, but uh, what do you really, if you could change one thing, what would yeah, it be? I've actually been uh, lucky to be honest that um, the Japanese have, uh, the translation for the Japanese word crisis as opportunity. And I think that's a good thing. I've been incredibly lucky that I came in January just when the crisis happened. To be honest, because uh, first of all, I told myself I wasn't the cause of the crisis, so I slept well at night. And, and secondly, it gave me a little bit of an opportunity because if I would have come in as a a uh, new CEO and set the targets higher and tell them to do this or this and have a one of these power or a Boy Scout uh, price, I don't think I would have gotten a lot of people with me. And now I have a burning platform. Uh, this is a great company, as you rightfully say. There's a lot of things going for it. But it's not about um, you know uh, progress you make versus your internal uh, positions or where you came from. It's obviously the gaps you have to close versus your competitive set or creating new gaps for competitive advantage. And frankly, we had some of those, and we still have some of those. And the crisis is a good opportunity to close and create our own gaps. Uh, if there's one thing, it's in the area of culture and organization. Um, you, you rightfully say there's a lot to be proud of in this company. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have been there since 1930 and, and created this uh, tremendous institution. But uh, we're focusing in this crisis on getting a little bit more of a bias for action, on increasing external focus around the consumer and customer, and a higher level of accountability and responsibility. 
those are the three areas I think will give us a longer term competitive advantage when we come out of this. So that for us would be the areas of focus to transform this culture to, uh, to truly be competitive. And how do you, you know, one of the questions that often arises, Paul, is, you know, how do you know it's going fast enough? So, you know, it's directionally correct, no doubt. Uh, and you know, it's focused on very sensible things. But how can we engage? Well, it's not just about uh, speed or, or being first. It's being right first. So you have to be careful. Never put in the organization just the word speed, speed, speed. But uh, I always remember Mario Andretti, the uh, Formula One race car driver, who simply said, "When things around me go faster than I am, I know I'm in trouble." So uh, increasingly uh, benchmarking versus the external world and, and seeing where you want to win areas where you want to have points of parity or points of competitive advantage. So this external focus or this benchmarking is very important. Also what uh, Jeremy was saying is we as leaders have to create the right environment around there to do that. I was one of the first ones, uh, not, uh, not taken uh, friendly by many, to uh, drop guidance and, and just run our company and have the numbers speak versus having it linked to uh, quarterly or yearly promises and then starting to chase our tail. So create the right environment for the business to prosper. Benchmark continuously for the external world. And, and then with our management team, we've instilled a certain pacing in the business by communicating an awful lot, explaining the sense of urgency, uh, creating this reality, as we call it, um, to be sure that, uh, that people buy in to, to the need for fast direction. Uh, just to make it come alive very simply, uh, we monitor our businesses in different cells, what we call cells, which would be hair care in, in Germany, or our knorr business in, in Mexico, or our ice cream business in, in Russia would be cells. And we look at all of the cells, and if our shares go down, we want plans to be agreed and in place in, in 30 days, and have them hit the market uh, as soon as possible, obviously. That creates a sense of urgency, a simple thing to do. I abolished the yearly targets. I had no idea what this economy was going to do. And we moved the system to six months targets. So it's a simple thing to do, but it's quite a revolution. Simply by the targets. We used to have in our company a few hundred targets for our different business units. Now it's three targets. Underlying volume growth, operating margin, and welcome capital. And everybody knows what they need to focus on. So you can do a lot of things, even short time, to create that sense of urgency. Well, uh, given that we have half our top management from Unilever's, uh, I think the job is pretty much done then. <laughs> uh, on a serious note, I think what we have tried to do is combine risk-taking abilities with uh, very fine operating uh, processes. And uh, my, my job as the leader in the organization has been to ensure that while we can't take those wild risks that we have uh, taken to grow up to where we are, but uh, still risk taking ability is very, very important. And as you grow big and comfortable, you are one of the iconic successes in the country, the risk taking ability suffers dramatically. And uh, the, the question therefore is how do you fuse the risk taking abilities with managers who have come from study state cycle? And uh, so far it's working very well and the lead indicators for us are, of course, looking at the traditional things of market share, brand preferences, customer side. But I think more importantly, are we every few months creating something dramatically different than opposition and putting that in the marketplace as early as we can? Uh, the, my, my personal assessment is the company is still having that uh, deep uh, sense of adventure within the entire company. They like to do things which are different and innovative. Uh, when uh, about three years back, we decided to outsource most of our operations in networks, IT, there were shockwaves around the globe. And I still remember there was a massive debate in the board. Nobody's done it. We are too large to risk this one. And my personal view was that we will fail if we don't do it. And while my CEO was convinced, but he could not carry uh, the board and the shareholders. And that was the time when as an entrepreneur, I could put my neck on the line to say, if this doesn't work, I'll be responsible. And uh, that has now become the business model of the world. People don't run networks or will stop running networks in the future. People like Ben, who was here in the previous session, has now taken over a large part of the networks and managing it uh, throughout the country. Ericsson, Nokia, IBM, they all do it. And we concentrate where we need to concentrate. Brand, customer management, billing and collection, 
and we do it very well. Given that we are a first generation company, we have been strengthening a lead over established players, including Vodafone, who is coming to India now in a very, very big measure. And I think uh, for me to watch uh, at all points in time is, is the company still has the appetite to take risks and go for something more bold and innovative? That really becomes very important. And as you know, my businesses are regulated, highly regulated, and we also need to be clear that we are uh, using technology to stay ahead of the curve in regulation because there are dramatic shifts in where we are. Every morning when you wake up, the ground moves, sometimes a few inches, but sometimes a very, very large uh, uh, measurement of shift happens in the marketplace. Uh, digital movements, IP is coming in in a very big way, voice is moving to data in a dramatic way, phone is becoming a lifestyle management from just telecommunications, money transfers, mobile payments, and commerce, entertainment. Everything is kind of moving into this one single device. And uh, the company has to keep on changing. Is it a telecom company? My answer is not anymore. It's a lifestyle company. You have to ensure that the customers are getting their entertainment, their e-commerce, and by the way, telephony as well at the same time. And yet you need to invest serious amounts of money. I'm in the 16th year of my mobile business, and we are still not cash flow positive. It requires massive amounts of uh, reinvestments back into the business because technology keeps on shifting all the time. So I think we are passing the test so far, but uh, really this is a test for all small companies which have become very large to ensure that uh, we are forever managing an environment of risk taking abilities. Terrific. Oftentimes in past uh, recessions, past downturns, there's been a reshuffling of the league table. So. Uh, you know, those who were, uh, uh, Dave makes great, great headway against Goliath. Is, in, in your assessment, tell us a little bit about each of your industries. Is this a chance for the, you know, the big to get bigger? They come in with greater resources, bigger balance sheets, and so forth. Is this a chance for the new, new India to come up, you know, the next generation of entrepreneurs to unseat uh, the incumbents? Of course, not uh, uh, Bharti Airtel, but, you know, those other incumbents. Uh, what do you think, how do you think five years from now, the dust is settled from the current economic crisis, and we'll go through each of you in turn, what will the industry have looked like? Those who have emerged on top, what will they have done right relative to those who have lost ground? Well, again, it's in the area of uh, innovation and newness of a business. For a startup uh, entrepreneur or a company to do something exactly what the big boys are doing, that's an impossible game. You cannot win the game. And we realized that very early on that you have to do something very different. Or, for, for example, in India, entry to industries which have not been tried before. So each of my uh, business uh, ventures uh, before telecom and not telecom have been first of the block. So how can you identify an opportunity where you are entering into the game at the same time as the big boys? I think that, to my mind, is the first starting point. And even if the big boys are coming at the same time, you stand a much better chance. Having said that, I have to be very honest. Uh, when I was uh, young, uh, coming into business, looking at these large, iconic business houses, I was constantly told, the league tables are gone, the podium, uh, the three top positions, one, two, three, ten, hundred thousand 100,000 are all gone. You would better be advised to look at something small and modest. The fact is, somebody always comes and shakes the table. And the poor positions are always stumped. And uh, you, you said yourself, many in the Fortune 500 don't exist today. And it was earlier said that those who came in the crisis of 1929 have actually come and stumped the tables. So I have to confess that it would be foolish for me to say that we will always be there. I was not there yesterday, I am here today. Who knows where we will go tomorrow? The question really would be, can we leave a sustainable legacy? The only way to do is watch what the young entrepreneurs are doing. My worry is never an AT&T, BT, or Vodafone. That's never my worry. They are more bureaucratic than I am today. The worry is the small guys. And I watch them very, very closely. It is extremely important for me and my team to watch the small guys. Jeremy, when Goliath wins, David upsets. How do you see that playing out? I think um, our, our sector is, is sort of in constant change. You know, I think I don't see major in technology reforms particularly changing. So I think, first of all, you have to have an acceptance that the rate and pace of change, you know, is, is uh, it is what it is. That is, this is normality. Uh, and it's certainly not going to slow. And therefore, I think in that environment, you know, the opportunity is open to, to, to all. I think 
big companies can, can emerge, but I think also you can see you know, small companies can, can do well. And importantly, if you know, lead the, lay the seeds of you know, future long-term growth and undermine big companies if they you know, are uh, too Goliath-like and, and, and able to change. I think companies that will be successful will you know, do a combination of things. I think they will expose the long, they will understand and expose their business to the long-term trends that are going to sustain the business uh, over time. In our, you know, in our sector, you know, pay, pay TV looks like a pretty good place to be. We shouldn't be surprised by that. People are very comfortable paying for every other form of entertainment. You know, why would they you know, be uncomfortable with paying for television? I think um, investing where customers see value at the same time as driving you know, efficiency in your core operations is a, just a, a basic you know, table stakes to develop a successful business. And to Sunil's point, I think successful companies will be the companies who, throughout the current downturn, stay tuned to the long-term sources of durability and success, you know, which is about, I think, brand and reputation, about your employee base, and about core elements of the infrastructure. And I think if you can do those things, then you know, you'll, be, you'll be investing in the right places for the, for the long term. But let's, but let's be clear, I, I look at my own kids and I look at the way they consume media and TV today and it tells me two things. It tells me that there are no old loyalties. You know, they, have, they will look at Sky Sports and the BBC and Paramount Comedy through exactly the same optics and, and it tells me that they're very willing to be promiscuous and that is both the source of opportunity and the source of threat. Good. Yeah, I agree. I think I was just listening. Uh, I think the main, uh, the companies that survive will be the ones that smartly balance the short term and the long term. Uh, the most of the articles you read is you have to take care of your costs, you have to take care of your cash, and it's undoubtedly uh, the case that uh, cash is king in this environment. But it's not all about hunkering down. And sometimes you feel if you read the announcements of what most of the companies do is that they've just decided to be in the shrinking mode, and uh, this is no better opportunity to be become more efficient on your cost structure, but also to invest in the future. So companies that stay close to the consumer in our industry, close to the consumer and customer, companies that invest in advertising, promotion, and R&D, which in our case are both up, I, I have to say, and continue to innovate, at the same time as driving the discipline in today's world. Now it also obviously helps if you have strong brands. Uh, it's, uh, it's strong brands create that loyalty, consumers in this, time of uncertainty are actually looking for for more of a beacon to hold on to. So I think strong brands have a, a wonderful time to become stronger. Uh, we've always talked about brands number three and four uh, not having a place. I think that will be accelerated. You'll see uh, less brands on the shelf and the stronger brands getting stronger. And then companies that have strong leadership. Uh, this is a, a time period where you have to uh, you know have a little bit of a, a stronger spine than, uh, probably have in the past and it requires a good leadership team to uh, to be able to do this so we look at this as an opportunity for us as well to strengthen our own leadership and, uh, and obviously um, invest behind our strong core brands as a priority which we're doing and then finally there are some opportunities as uh, as you are in a good financial situation that, that we happen to be in thank God there are some wonderful opportunities out there that help us to consolidate the industry a little faster and make it less painful for some companies by just uh, taking them out of business so they don't have to suffer. And, and the consumer can then use our products. It's practically corporate philanthropy. It is philanthropy. <laughs> <laughs> it's philanthropy. Absolutely. Don't you know, just, just, just speak of the yeah, so 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 thing so off. It seems to be really important in terms of you know, the organization and, 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 and how you manage the downturn. First of all, you know, the, you know, the, the recession is here, you know, none of us created it. I know when we don't, we don't spend, you know, we don't come in at Sky you know, to uh, bounce off four walls about the economy to end up in the same place. You know, you know, it is what it is. And I think actually, you know, during the course of the career, managing businesses through a down cycle as well as an up cycle you know, is part of the challenge that, uh, that we all face. So I think, you know, I don't want to say I'm trying about it, but if you can sort of see it as a source of opportunity, but, but just see it for what it is and accept it and then move on from it, I think is important. And I think the second thing is don't underestimate the importance of collective determination and willpower. You know, if culturally you know, you've got the belief and the desire to succeed, you know, that's going to count for a lot, I think, also. 
the last few years. I think you'd be surprised in countries how sometimes that gets forgotten. Now, we spend a few minutes and turn it to you. Are there questions you'd like to ask our panelists uh, about this topic of seizing the upside of the downturn, or indeed more uh, broadly? We have, and we'll take a few as been the convention. We have someone here, someone in the uh, middle right, uh, and someone here as well. So maybe we'll take three questions and then divvy them up a bit. Yeah, please, if you could identify yourself uh, and uh, tell us your question as well. Hi, uh, my name is Tim Collins. I work for Circle Health for start a healthcare company uh, running at NHS and private hospitals. And I'm very interested in the panel's views on you know, how can startup companies benefit in this particular recession where access to capital has just almost dried up overnight. And I'm sure you know, your companies in the past have required huge amounts of capital to grow. So how do you think startup companies in this particular recession can try and benefit from this now? Terrific, thanks. We'll take a couple and we'll, uh, we'll uh, take them one by one. Is there one here, yes? Roger Edwards. Uh, I'm on the, the school around about the time of my direction through, which is yeah, quite some time ago. For much of that time, uh, I've been following the steel industry, and I work for a company yeah. called Steel Business Briefing. It seems to me today we've, we've had a lot of ignored the capital intensive sector. So my question is, um, how does the panel see the future for that sector is kind of a downturn. The high fixed costs complex. Jeff, you know, I've heard some of it this morning with the natural resources, but where it's best to make it is often not where the market's at. I just appreciate views on that. Sure. And we had one more over here, was it?
But the fact is we have invested close to $20 billion in telecommunications and a few billion dollars in other businesses. It would have been absolutely impossible for me not to yield large amounts of equity to foreign partners and large players. In my case, I also was very clear that unashamedly I needed to ride on the wings of very large players. So what could I offer? I could offer understanding of my business, I could offer understanding of India, and I was happy to go and tap onto large, big enterprises globally to come and join hands. And they did. British Telecom, Telecom Italia, AT&T, uh, Vodafone, Singapore Telecommunications, and many others. Walmart, AXA now have come and joined hands. And we were good partners. They all made money. Uh, they all saw very transparent way of working. So I would say money will come. I mean, you may have heard these stories that entrepreneurs finally get their money. And trust me, you will be able to. Yeah, I, I would say this is a better time than ever for startups. It sounds counterintuitive, but since your name is Tim Collins, which is close to Jim Collins, he talks about the end and or mentality. And I think this is the end mentality versus or. There's no trade-off. Private equity that could uh, leverage a lot and money was freely available has given us some problems that I hope we would not repeat too much in the future. And uh, having some scarcity of capital uh, actually uh, adds to the quality of ideas. So I personally think it's a great thing. And, and good ideas will survive if these statistics are right that most of these, uh, or half of the companies in the Fortune 500 started in, in recessions, it would make that point and would support that point. We as a company have a 600 million fund that we would love to invest in startups because we look at the future and we want new innovations, we want discontinuous innovations. And frankly, we have uh, a hard time uh, being able to invest that money today as well as yesterday if you want to. So there are opportunities out there if the ideas are right. I don't think you have to be uh, worried about that. And, and it might be a good thing if it's more difficult to question the ideas itself, probably as a starting point. Well, Paul is ensured he's going to be deluged by the entrepreneurs in the audience uh, after this session. Uh, Jeremy, I wonder if you could tackle the capital uh, intensive one. Although it is true, you know, we're not talking about steel mills here, uh, but uh, you know, it is a business that requires a lot of investment content. So, forth. how do you think that uh, changes yeah, the I mean, dynamics? I, I, I think uh, I'm sure right now it's it's, it's the pressures on particularly uh, particularly acute. I guess the, the, you know, the things that go through my mind is yeah, you really have the flexibility. If there's, if there's a big high cost in the capital base, you know, how do you uh, how do you aggregate scale across that? Perhaps you know you need to have less ownership and control of that. You're willing to partner, collaborate, draw more people in, so that you've got more confidence about the scale that you can put through um, that sort of um, that sort of investment. Again, you know, how can you share in, in relation to that more of the uh, more of the more of the infrastructure? And I guess thinking about how can you better match your revenue and investment. I mean, uh, you know. It seems to me often time when you look at these big, highly capital intensive uh, projects, a bit like us, you know, if somebody says you put a satellite in the sky, the problem with that is that you're spending 250 million up front with a long tail of return. So what we have chosen to do is partner in those areas with providers where we can have much more alignment of interest that allows us to spread our return, but at the same time we're willing to get very, very long term uh, relationships and agreements and commit to long-term agreements with our partners, which allows them really to anchor their business model and then go and raise the finance that they need to raise to do those sorts of things. So they're the sorts of things that I think you, know, you need to think of. Yeah, the only other point I'd make is that uh, these capital intensive industries, it's a buyer's market. You know, look at how Mittal Steel was built largely bought at a time when, you know, steel mills were being sold at a dime on the dollar. Uh, Carnival Cruise Line's rise was largely driven by capacity expansion at the depth of the downturn. So one of the key things is these are asset intensive industries. It's a buyer's market. If you can access the funding through whatever mechanism, it's a terrific opportunity to accumulate uh, uh, assets that will position you for the future. On this point of collaboration, Paul, is that uh, P&G was mentioned, uh, and uh, you're long, actually you have two veterans of P&G here, uh, in this con you know, very important under A.G. Laffey, P&G collaboration. How are you thinking about that having been P&G in, uh, you know, now in Unilever, the role of collaboration in, you know, kind of seizing the opportunities that lay in front of you? Yeah, well, 
mean, there's nothing new, nor is it proprietary to P&G or any other company. It is uh, it's basically very simply built on the statistic that there are 6.5 billion people out there, and even uh, great companies like ours only have 175,000 on the payroll. So you have to start from the assumption that there are probably more and better ideas out there than in our own company. Uh, so um, as we uh, uh, as, as the economic situations get tougher, you have to be very clear as you work with the retailers uh, or as you work your, your innovations um, that you work on, on making the pie bigger and not just on negotiating who gets which slice of the pie. So the need for cooperation in this environment actually would be higher and higher and higher. At uh, Unilever, we have now appointed an R&D director at board level. We have created a structure that allows us to work significantly better with our uh, innovation partners, and we hope, obviously, that we earn the right to have the best ideas come to us on top of what we can do ourselves. With the retailers, likewise, you have to win with the shopper as well as the consumer. Uh, as, as you know from, from the Walmart experiences or from your own in India, you have to uh, get the best knowledge together of the two and you can actually significantly increase these markets and you have to work together. So creating incre increasingly these networks or open open uh, societies, if you want to, is absolutely crucial to survive in the future. I don't see that differently. And I think uh, every company aspires to do that. Some companies do it and others just continue to talk about it. Terrific. In the interest of time, we're going to draw to a close here. Before we do, I'd ask each of you any closing thoughts, quick, uh, quick things you'd like to share with the audience. Yeah. I would say every downturn brings massive opportunities. Uh, my own company is now age for international, but it would have never been a better time than now. Uh, consolidation is inevitable in our industry. I could have done it some years back when everything was hunky dory. This is the time to strike. And therefore, to my mind, downturn does give opportunities. It is for the bold and brave to go and grasp. I think I'd say, you know, don't, don't define outcomes, define trends. Um, and then from that, you know, do two things. First of all, back yourself. Be you willing to invest in your strategy. If you're not willing to back yourself, who else is going to do so? At the same time, they're staying flexible, you know, constantly driving you know, operational efficiency, which will allow you the headroom to start to, you know, to keep investing you know, in the things that you think are most important. I agree with uh, Sano. It's uh, Churchill who says that a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity and an optimist sees an opportunity in every difficulty. And I think that's a lot of elements of truth in there. Besides what has been said, I just want to end with another thought that we haven't talked about, and that is in terms of balancing the short term and the long term. Um, I always like to quote a little bit uh, Viktor Frankl, who wrote this book in Sons of Meaning. He was a victim of, uh, unfortunately, the Nazi concentration camp. And in this book, In Search of Meaning, he made a very perceptive statement that said, next to the tremendous opportunities we have, and he expressed it like this way, next to the Statue of Liberty that we built on the East Coast, we should have built a Statue of Responsibility on the West Coast. And I think in this time of crisis that we have today, where a lot of people hunker down and, and try to survive short term, it's very important that we all, uh, institutions like ours, also take the, the responsibility for the long term. Uh, this world has some tremendous issues. I'm sure Jeff Emil talked about uh, climate change, or uh, for the first time again, poverty and hunger are going up again, water shortage, uh, the, the, the economic divide, which unfortunately is getting bigger again as a result of a lot of the things that I talked about. So within all of this, and talking about how we survive the next six months or 12 months, I think we should have the, the courage and the responsibility to take this broader perspective and be sure that we as companies, as individuals, continue to have the courage to speak out and obviously put our word where our mouth is and take the actions to be sure that we do the right thing for many generations to come as well. Perfect. Well, I can't imagine a better closing than Churchill and Victor Frankl in the same uh, comments. So with that, uh, we close the panel and thank very much our panelists for discussing with us uh, not only the nature of the opportunities that arise in a downturn, but some of the things they're doing to pursue them, uh, as well as some of the requirements for leaders to do the same. So thank you, gentlemen.